Jesus Welcome everybody to another edition of the Turkey Steak Podcast. We are back again, and that is too good to leave out of the intro. Uh, for yet another edition of what we hope is your favorite hockey podcast that's barely about hockey, we call it a fraudcast. For those of you that might be new uh, to the show, my name is Toogie. I am joined alongside Mr. Sim for the win. Yes. Whose dulcet here. tones you have I already... I didn't realize we were recording, to be honest, but... Uh... <laughs> Me neither. Or, let's, I let's didn't go. see the notification. I didn't see it on top. I was like, oh boy. And Mr. Endurance M... Is Hi. here as well. Hello. A very tired man. He he plays hockey. He eats hot chip, does not lie, and plays <laughs> FIFA Pro Clubs. I also eat Subway. Subway is pretty decent. It's pretty good. Did you get a cookie? I did not get a cookie. Eat, eat Subway. Eat bresh. Eat bresh. Because mostly bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Subway. Eat bread. Eat bresh. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, I remember that. It's like, oh, Subway, it's healthy. Well, except the fact you're eating a whole loaf of bread. <laughs> and processed meat. Yeah. Although, to be fair, they barely give you any meat. Skimp suck. No, Man, I used, yeah, I used to be like, all right, this is healthy. And then I'd order, like, the Italian sandwich that was just, like, salami. And <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. Oh, it man. What's so your good. go-to orders at Subway? If you guys I haven't remember. I had Subway in, like, a decade. Same. That's what I said. If you remember, okay. Um, it, cold cut combo. There you it go. Had to have been. That's it. You get the cold cut combo. It's the way to do yeah. it. On uh, Talk Italian about urban a cheese. In one. Urban cheese. Let's go. <laughs> the Happy Gilmore thing. Was yeah. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think the last thing I really would eat from there, uh, the meatball sandwich or like that spicy mm. Italian, whatever the hell they called it, on flatbread. Yeah. And oh. then what was that like? onion balsamic dressing or the honey ball some kind of sweet balsamic mm -hmm. so i mean to be fair i didn't make my sandwiches healthy but they're not healthy anyway some some sort of balls fucking dressed toasted <laughs> toasted too mayonnaise there you go cheese and maybe, yeah they skip kind of italian cheese like what the hell that's the main things in a sandwich unless you're my girlfriend who makes meatless sandwiches which weirded me the fuck out yeah yeah that's a thing. like Lettuce, tomato. Yeah, like vegetables and bread. I was so taken aback. I was like, that's not a sandwich. Baby, that's, there's, that's no, a salad. there's no meat. It's a salad on bread. <laughs> like, God, damn it. Salad bowl, buddy. What what's going on here? Yeah, she <sighs> was and she was taken aback that a sandwich had to have meat. <laughs> <laughs> You're a million miles away from home, and that's the that's the breaking point. Just no nah, meat in my I was, sandwich. I was, I was here. She, we, we were having a video call, and she was like, "She's like, yeah, I made a sandwich." I'm like, "Well, what's in the sandwich?" And she showed me. I'm like, "That's okay." Then you, you go, eh, uh, yeah, and you just go disconnect, and you just. <laughs> uh, so this, good. everybody, is what this show is going to be today, because there is very, very little to talk about. It feels like, which means this show will still end up being two hours somehow. I don't know how that'll yeah. work out, but it always does. Um, yeah, gentlemen, you're both doing well. I'm doing well. Everyone's yeah. doing well. We're, we're doing well. Yeah, once that event. Yeah, once that event that the Raptors had, uh, they gave me a sweet shirt, and I was talking to Johnny, aka the Owe. Uh, if you guys watch us play FIFA Pro Clubs, uh, he was saying like, "Oh, the jersey's sick. Everything was everything was awesome. Everything was cool. They sold out like 400 tickets in less than 24 hours, and mm. which is which is pretty big for an event like that because it was mm. the Toronto Ultra Esports team, so the COD Esports team." And Toronto Raptors Uprising, so it was a Raptors team as well. We got the we got the shoot on the court as well. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of air balls from everybody, including myself. Um, I think because we were the last people to go up, we ended up running a four v four side uh, pickup game. It was crazy. No one else is running pickup games at all. We just ran a pickup game. It was pretty sweet. Um, if I can find the shirt. Uh, I can probably show you guys. I'll show you guys later, but it's super sick. We're like, this, this jersey design's awesome. It's like great design. He's like, oh, he got some guy of Fiverr to do it. And we're like, Fiverr? What? And it's crazy how you get the, the quality of work you can find online. 
especially on websites like Fiverr. Like, yeah, I'm about to be on Fiverr. There you go. What you gonna do? Several things. There, there you go. There you go. He's he's a man of many talents. <laughs> Get that money, bro. God. Anyway, uh, I was actually gonna ask you about that whole event because there were a whole lot of people there that we uh, that we know, and it's like, ah, yeah. To go to. So it was like Rahil, Safir, Terry was there. Um, Bones was also there too. Uh, we didn't claimed get to... that he hit a half court shot, and it he was did a not hit a half court. Furry. Fuck that! He did yeah, not hit a half court shot. <laughs> Dude, like hit a three point, and then like walked moonwalks very very quickly to the back line and pointed downwards. Like, oh, I hit it from over there. <laughs> I... He did like the step back, like the the shot when you step back Dude. off the fade, and then like, oh yeah, right here after these, Dude, these he... steps I took is where I hit Dude. the shot wasn't even a step back that was a fucking that was a walk back not even a step he just fucking lunged okay like triple <laughs> jump backwards to make it past the line kind of thing but it was pretty good it was a lot of fun yeah uh there was a bunch of red bull stuff whatever uh the food surprisingly was good even though it was kind of like oh here's a pizza here's a there's a drink and like a bunch of smarties or whatever skittles it was pretty good good event I can't wait for the next one because we all know that, you know, the all-star game is going to be in Toronto this year. There's probably going to be an event there. I know the NHL already has one for, you know, GWC, but 10 to one, there's going to be an event for the NHL stuff and it'll be sick to see what they have planned. And hopefully I can help out in some sort of way on the helping outside of things because running those events looks like a lot of fun. Support our lovely friends uh, with uh, the Toronto NBA esports team. The uh, yes, yeah, support the Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. Do which is they cool. need your yes. money? They do, absolutely <laughs> do. They're the hurt. biggest, <laughs> the biggest sports organization in North America needs your grassroots support. Bring it back to grassroots. There you go. Do it that way. There Speaking of grassroots, this podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Yeah. And, uh, with a lot of nice products, including the new Lawnmower 5.0, which is, I have again, haven't got a chance to use it, but it's got a brighter light, awesome new features, better light, better stuff, boy. Um, better fates of Papa John's. <laughs> of course, use code 2 at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. Thank you to Manscaped for your continued support on this podcast. Yeah, we'd love you. This is going to be one of the strangest shows I think we've ever had. Yeah, let's keep is, going. Let's hit that topic. I agree. Well, here's the thing. We have a nice little warm-up question, as if we're not feeling warmed up enough as it is. Yeah. And this question comes from one Scroopy Noopers. Pretend you're on a deep space mission, and your spaceship supercomputer has an issue, forcing you to sacrifice most of the PC games you had stored. Because that's you where have I keep enough... my PC games. Mm. <laughs> Since you only have enough space to keep three games, what games do you pick? Expansions are included, but not sequels. And ignore the fact that some games require more memory than others. <laughs> like the meticulous detail here. Um, yeah, so three PC games. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. Um, well, this first is one, the sitting question for sure. Yeah, first one's going to be Total War Warhammer 3 because I have sunk so much time into that game. I'm probably going to surpass the 2K hours I set in the second one because it's going to be the last one in that series. Um, Second game, whew, probably would have to be Mountain Blade Bannerlord. Again, another game I played a lot. Very different. Uh, still, still sandbox strategy, but it's a more RPG slant with tactics rather than just a pure turn-based campaign and battle tactics from Skyvy perspective. The last one is tough, though. It's like, should I go with the, the chill game? Hmm. And is the question. Yeah, why only three? I got so much more. Uh, because it's supposed to be a tough question. I know. But I hate it. Um, I'm actually going to pull up my Steam. If you guys have your three right off the bat, I'm taking a look at my Steam right here. There so you I go. would go and know you want to go. Uh, Sure. Yeah. Um, My top three would be the first one is like a recent one battle bit because it like runs on like a potato. 
if you aren't familiar what battle bit is it is basically <clears throat> how do i describe it it's call um, of duty minecraft graphics uh low poly battlefield actually mm, whatever because it has vehicles and all that stuff and the gameplay is actually relatively good uh second one would probably be mirror's edge the original that was one of my favorite games as a kid um even though i came out when i was like 10 11 12 i mean i guess i was a kid then but uh yeah small really child. fun game that th- that thing ran on i had a weird like business computer that i had for a while um had like one of those like old ibm think pads with the fingers uh, the finger um scanner um what else uh it was yeah that thing ran on there like a fucking beast i don't know how the hell it did it um and the third one would hmm the thing is though, i didn't play a lot of pc games growing up so i only got into like pc gaming later like around mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. 17 to like and you grew now. up in a small town as a chimney sweep and tell us about your parents yeah <laughs> Uh, my third game would be Skyrim, of course. I have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was, I was trying to get created, but I was like, eh, yeah, I need an RP, like a true RPG. So I have a good one. Yeah, Skyrim, and then a half RPG, half tactic, Bannerlord, and then full tactic, Warhammer. So those are my three. My question is, like, do you have, like, online players or just mostly offline play? Because that changes my whole thing entirely. Like, if you're in the shuttle. Assume it doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter? Okay. I don't know. Um, I was... I, I, I was I was torn between Skyrim and WoW, but I haven't actually played the new WoW expansion, so Skyrim took the for me. Well, Endo figures out for sure, but he wants to do. Yeah. Um. Oh God. Oh, I got it. Brink. Right. I fucking love Brink. That game got shit on so hard because it was so broken at launch. Uh, fucking topical. Um, but. Mm. Dude, I love that game. It is so much fun. Just the free running and everything on there, the smart, smoothly move across rugged terrain. Dude, uh, back when I was in Army Cadets, when I was like 14, we ended up going to training over in Borden. So it's kind of like a, like an hour sort of whatever. We got We had access to an arcade, and you could rent out consoles and everything. And every fucking day that I wasn't doing training, we had time off. I would go to the, I would go to the the canteen. I would get a PS3, two controllers, and my buddy and I would just play Brink the entire fucking time. Is it on That's PC? All we would play. Uh, no, it was on PS3, Xbox 360, but it has a PC release as well. Okay, just yeah. making sure. Yeah, the the PC release ended up being free to play. So for me. Um, we'd go football manager so I could finally have time to learn how to play that because if I'm on a <laughs> spaceship hurtling through Uh-oh. the cosmos, then well, I would probably have it? time to finally figure out how to fucking play that. Um, I would also, oh, God, well, see, in my head, I'm like sports sims. I'd want to learn that, but if I could only choose one, I'd go with uh, a game called TEW Total Extreme Wrestling, which is a, a wrestling based kind of sim that's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, I, I would, I would go with played up played up is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, run, running my own kitchen, cooking, cooking the bird. So that's the three you're going with the football manager, the wrestling manager and played. Oh, well, I, one of the, well, so, okay. So if I had to choose, I'd choose one of the two Sims, probably uh-huh. probably Which go with one? the wrestling one. Let's be honest. All right. Um, I'd go with played up and I would go with trombone champ. Because that game will never fail to make me laugh because it's fucking hilarious and the premise is so ridiculous. Sin and I are similar people, but very different people. <laughs> yeah, that's very different. Uh, yeah, Trombone God. Champ's pretty, pretty, pretty good. It's so fucking dumb. I love it. I love it so much. Ah, oh, goodness. Well, speaking of dumb. Let's get into talking about some of the very few hockey things that we actually have to talk about. And what better way to segue than by mentioning everybody that it's official. The NHL has fully launched their NFT. I mean, digital collectible platform in the year of our Lord 2023. I love this so much. In typical NHL fashion, they're multiple years late and 
completely understanding the temperature of the room as well. <laughs> Do you guys yeah. remember when they first announced this and then the NHL account got hacked like immediately after? No. No. Okay. So what happened is they announced this a few years ago. It's like, hey, we're going to be diving into NFTs. And then within like 10 minutes, the official NHL account got hacked. And it was really, really funny. It was like, they were just spamming a bunch of like other nonsense on there. I can't remember. It was like NHL, Twitter, or X account no. uh, got hacked. NHL, Twitter, hack. Two minutes for hacking. The NHL's Twitter account has been compromised. By Michael Murray from Haslift.net. Here you go. Fair enough. It was really, it was really weird because it just like happened, and then I think everyone was <laughs> laughing about it. And mm. yeah, it was not good. Oh, so that's a good photo. Po- that's a good photo they used there of Lou Longo just kind of looking up like, oh boy. So NFTs going off of Google Trends peaked when. If you guys had to guess, when did NFTs peak? 2020. Uh, let's say June 2020. No, it's 2021. January of 2022 oh. was when it hmm. fell. So oh, yeah. I, I say that not to be like, oh, you guys were wrong. But that is when most people would be like, yeah, that's when NFTs peaked. The idea of them being... January. The idea of them being so late to the party, and then even if the reality is that NFTs as a whole pretty much peaked in January of 2022, they are still essentially two years late to the party. And not only is it like NFTs in general, you can make the direct comparison to NBA's version of what the NHL is doing now, which was NBA Top Shot, which for a short amount of time was huge. Mm-hmm. absolutely huge this month the maker of NBA Top Shot Dapper Labs laid off 22% of its workforce during a period at the beginning of last season in the NBA Top Shot saw a decline of 94% in sales on the platform compared to the previous season uh, this information, by the way, coming from uh, Nick Ashbourne at Yahoo Sports. Um, I, <laughs> it, it's just the NHL being so, so NHL at this stage. And it, I almost feel bad for taking shots at them because you have to you have to feel some. Sim- Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't have to feel sympathy, but I do in nope. some ways of just like you can't. You can't possibly be this dumb and this far behind. But they are. They are. They are always dumb and this far behind in so many <sighs> ways. <laughs> like, yeah, this is. I mean, it was, first of all, to be late to a bad idea is even worse than really participating in the bad idea. Mm, Especially yeah. because there's always going to be idiots who take a bad idea and try to run with it early on, and then scammers who jump in on the bad idea and try to strike while the iron is hot. So there's always going to be that period of insanity, whether it's Beanie Babies or Pogs. But in this case, you don't even own anything. You own a link, and you don't own a physical anything. The fact of the matter is literally anyone can make infinite duplicate copies of it, And if no one gives a fuck that you have a link saying you own this, Mm. then it's you, then it's worthless. The market provides value. It's not some, it's not a link that gives intrinsic value. A market provides value. How dare you call my monkey JPEG worthless? (laughs) <laughs> the, the link to my monkey JPEG, sir. Yeah, is like, not worthless. if more people oh actually gave a shit, like and and actually believed in it, then it could have actually become sustainable. But the fact of the matter is, so many people are just like, "This is stupid." I can literally download and save this. Like, it's not physical. I don't care that you have a link. And that was the whole thing. Like to troll these guys, people are just downloading their pictures and saying, "Oh, look, thanks." <laughs> and the guy, you know, it's. And it didn't help that so many of the NFT people were like idiots. The, yes, and, and very obnoxious idiots, and were yeah. very susceptible to being trolled. 
some of them I felt bad for, other ones I don't. But yeah, yeah. S- stupid. Like, why would you pour that much money into stuff? And like the guy who like had a board ape and it went up to like 1.2 million and he's like i'm not selling i'm like you're, you're an idiot idiot bro like you just gained five thousand percent value you you don't you think that's you think... <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the problem yeah. with an nft it's a one like so like it's not like stocks or options where it's like okay i went up it skyrocketed i'm gonna sell a certain percentage so that i not only get my money back but i take profit as well hmm I don't know, man. NHL, two years behind at least. <laughs> yeah. It's just insane to me. Like, literally, uh, an article on Yahoo wrapped up as like, man, even if it, even if they released this two years ago to the day, they are catching, like, the last gasp of, of mm-hmm. any sort of, like, profitability off of NFTs at that yeah. stage. So it was mm. the dead cat bounce. That was it. Man. Funny about that, how we talk about NFTs and shit. Did you hear about what happened with the the board ape, the board uh, ape kids or whatever? Yeah, I was just gonna bring that up. That's the last time. The only time NFTs are in the news is when they're blinding people. Oh my god! So, to if you're unaware of, of what happened, basically, is there was a giant like get together for people who party. have board, a- yeah, a yacht party for the board at yacht club members, and they decided to yeah. buy oh. expensive lights, right? Because they think, oh, if you buy cheap lights, they're not good quality. They bought like UV lights that are not designed to like, you know, be used for like display and everything. And it got to the point that people were suffering headaches and the next day they were going blind. They also got severe sunburns. Yeah. At night. <laughs> they were they're they're high the fuck is this lights. alaska like, they thought on. they thought they were very expensive black lights but what they really are is essentially i forget i i, I saw it explained by by someone like a scientist in a certain field like they're like yeah we use these in our lab and we call them death rays because you don't go in with them where they are when they're on <laughs> like again and that to me so perfectly epitomizes what nfts were it's it was all this hype and in the end all you got was possibly fucking cancer (laughs) what is that quote the village idiot will become like a higher authority or whatever no i don't know yeah hold on there was something about that i this is like when i was a kid i heard about that am the village idiot yeah, am, am idiot. I don't know what that's saying. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, my brain's gonna melt if we talk about uh, NFTs any longer. So let's. I mean, know. hey, it's it's nice to talk about something that, like you said, is the equivalent of pogs or beanie babies in the year 2023. So. Oh, yeah. it was a Nostradamus quote. Hold on. Uh, the village idiot will come forward to be acclaimed the leader in the home of greatest power. So the biggest idiot of all the idiots gets the money, and look what they do with it. There you go. Guy or they don't because they don't dropping knowledge. Yeah. Or they don't because they don't sell the monkey JPEG for a million dollars. <laughs> anyway, my goodness, my goodness. Never, never a bad time to dunk on the NHL, though. You know, never a bad time. Um, it's also never a bad time to dunk on Toronto. small children. Oh, uh, that too. Oh, I, I wanted to dunk on those kids at the Raptors event. Anyways, Toronto. Yes. What about Toronto where everybody, where everything is about them, no matter what? The center of the universe, Toronto, in which there were rumors that Patrick Kane was going to be a Toronto Maple Leaf. And that was disputed today by one John Shannon. Uh, mentioning, quote, after hearing earlier in the week that Patrick Kane was scheduled to meet with the Maple Leafs on Tuesday, I can confirm that that meeting did not occur. Leaf sources reached out to me to say it did not happen. This reads as a very typical, if I float my client's name out there as his player agents and say Toronto's interested, that is guaranteed to get the news media cycle going, to get my client's name out there, and we'll steal some of the headlines. And it absolutely worked. 
Yeah, because it's uh, that's the easiest one to do it to. Because uh, yeah. every every single fan in Toronto, no matter what, thinks a specific player is coming to him. I mean, there's there's people there who are literally saying McDavid's coming there. I'm like, why? Oh why do you want McDavid? You literally have Matthews. You we literally have... won't be able to afford all of them. <laughs> We can't yeah. afford them now. Like, I, I don't get that, like, whole thing. And, like, even if we wanted Patrick Kane, that wouldn't solve any of our issues. That would not. That would just add more problems. We Sounds don't like a true need, living move to me. Yeah, mm. true living in the moment, baby. It's just you have all the offense in the world. They're clicking. You just need to add defensive-minded forwards and defensive-minded defensemen. And maybe a defensive-minded goalie, too. Like, at this point, I don't even know. It's just... Get get Dryden Hunt back over here. You know, he keeps going on waivers every other week. I think he was with... What, he's with... Uh, There's probably a reason for that. Calgary? Yeah, I don't know. I feel, I feel bad for the guy. It's fine, though, because the Leafs are going to trade for Nikita Zadorov. My God. They're going to sign Patrick Kane. They're going to trade for Connor McDavid. Um, they're they're gonna do all of it. It's gonna be great. Everything is gonna happen for them all at once. You know that movie from last year, everything, everywhere, all at once, or whatever the fuck. That's the yeah. Toronto Maple Leafs all the time. Every player, every draft pick, every prospect, every Stanley Cup, Toronto, all Toronto, at Toronto, once. all of it. Yeah, I was thinking of that when I was first talking about this, but just Jesus, it just doesn't make. I mean, it makes sense. It's Toronto. Like they, they, it's the team with the least amount of current success who thinks they're that successful. We've only gotten out of the first round once in the past 20 years. If Hmm. you really look at it, it's just, I don't know. It's just the Lulu, I guess, with the whole fan base thinking, you know, because we are a big hockey nation that we should get all these big players and everything. Like, I don't know what. Edmonton's going to do with McDavid. I think he's going to stay there, obviously. Like, they're going to protect him, protect him as much as possible. But Leafs need to just figure out defense. That's it. Just, just protect the, hold the fort, protect the house. That's basically what they have to do. And everything they've done so far is just like, you eh. are a hockey interview right now. I appreciate that. <laughs> hold the fort protect the house defense god when you when Fox nick when nick Ol, when nick olchek was on here talking about bite and i wasn't in here to listen to it, i was listening to it in the podcast like, this is such a hockey like lingo like episode mm-hmm. i'm like it yeah was a good time. it was <laughs> sorry it i was slept very- through it <laughs> ah that's okay that's all right you i'm know. kind of back on the show it's okay yeah it's okay so. okay to go do the things okay anyway um it's funny though because you mentioned you mentioned the oilers too and connor mcdavid because there they were the whole i think it was the, the whole report it's like jeff merrick being like yeah he's mcdavid's pissed and obviously <laughs> the the conversation like surrounding the leafs is always they're gonna get this guy they're gonna get that guy the conversation surrounding the Oilers so far this season has just been it's all a disaster. Everything sucks. We're all going to die. Um, and now, you know, the Oilers in the aftermath of firing their head coach. Well, hey, wouldn't you know, it's um, wins. Sweet, beautiful wins, right? Their next game isn't until Saturday. Uh, but prior to that, they beat the New York Islanders on Monday. They beat the Seattle Kraken on Wednesday night. Um, Like, God, what was it? Three goals in like six minutes at the end of the game or something like that. Evander Kane gets a hat trick. Um, It's it's been (laughs) that's almost more of an indictment on how rough it's been for Seattle as opposed to how bad or how good it's going for Edmonton now is man. Seattle has uh, not done too well this year, but yeah. I do wonder in regards to Edmonton, too. We actually had a viewer question um, in regards to Jack Campbell, who we talked about last week or earlier this week in regards to, okay, he was sent down, um, not doing so hot in the AHL. And the question was, you know, is he essentially the next Scott Darling of someone who had like one or two hot years and then completely fell out of the league? And we debated whether or not we were going to bring up this question on the show. And 
we decided to when Endo's answer was, yeah, probably, but Sins was, well, not necessarily. Jack Campbell, will he find himself back in the NHL? Or is that it for him? I mean, I never try to predict what's going to happen to a goaltender. That's fair. Um, yeah. Endo would actually, his point earlier um, was actually that Jack Campbell really never had that good of a year. Mm. And I debated that. I'm like, please, Leafs need to show their goalie some respect. Yeah. Um, I think he played good, but I don't think he was like, I don't think he was starter quality. I think he was good at a pinch when the Leafs needed him to go because Frederick Anderson got hurt. But I think, I mean, I think before I probably talked about him like great and was like, oh, he's a great goalie and everything. He's a great guy. That's the one thing. And being a great guy can only get you so far. That's the way I nice, see it as well, too. But nice just guys finish last in my right, boys. Hey, man. I mean, it worked for uh, like we found out Michael Hutchison. He's an amazing guy and he's still got opportunities playing in the A and the N even just as like a third, fourth string guy. So I I don't know. Um, I, I, I like Jack Campbell. I liked when he was here, but I don't think he, I don't think he was like cut out to be a starting goaltender for a franchise. Like okay. a good, like a two tandem goaltender. Sure. Um, or like I said, three goalie tandem with that one time. Um, but I think, Jack Campbell works really well on a team where he can be he can like split games half and half. I don't think he's he's good enough to in his current state to take the charge and be the number one guy. I was looking at Jack Campbell's numbers. So I was too. And yeah. <sighs> you you want to read them off or do I get to do that? I, I, yeah, I will. And then I'll, I'll let you get that rebuttal in there. So he was acquired uh, from the LA Kings in the middle of the 1920 season, 2019, 20 season, not 1920. Um, it's not 103 years ago um, on Los Angeles that year, 20 games played 900 save percentage in a two, eight, five goals against average. He goes to the Leafs plays six games with a nine, 15 save percentage in a two, six, three GAA. Not too bad. The next season, 22 games, a 921 save percentage, and a 215 goals against average, as well as seven playoff games with a 934 save percentage and a 181 goals against average, a series, of course, that they lost. 21 mm-hmm. 22 is final season with the Leafs. A 914 save percentage with a 264 goals against average in 49 games, but in seven playoff games had a 315 goals against average and an 897 save percentage. I will say in that 2021 20, 22 season, he did have a streak with, with the entirety of a month where his save percentage was super he he was not doing good. I will say that, like with the with the pride of everything. He got hurt because he he heated up. During the beginning of the season, and then he got his chance to go to the All Star game. Then after that, he was absolutely terrible. And then from there, he became streaky. And in the playoffs, he did really good. Yeah. And then once that Edmonton got the money, your save percentage can be in in a stretch when the sample size is only twenty two games, and this and it's a nine twenty one with a two one five goals against. No, the twenty twenty two season is twenty. 2023 season when he went to the huh? You the just 2021, said that he had a... 2022 season. His second season with Toronto is when he got the All Star nod. Then after oh, that he I got hurt. About... Okay. No, no. After that, that, that he got hurt. Yeah. After that he got hurt, and then his numbers just were not good. After that, he just wasn't the same goalie he was before. He played. He like when he's on, he's on. But when he's off, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Like how it's going right now, he has a 450 goals against average in the end, and a 436 in the A, and 
Bakersfield was running pretty well with him not being there. He's the only goaltender on their roster right now with Bakersfield to not have a single win. I will say, like conversation-wise, there's always a chance he could come back to the NHL level. I do think, obviously, I can't necessarily say like the Leafs dodged a bullet because I don't know if he'd be playing as poorly in Toronto as he has in Edmonton. Yeah. Um, obviously that's going to be like the natural conversation is like, Oh, well it's been fine. Um, you know, at the same time, like the Leafs are paying Ilya Samsonov 3.5 million this year. And in eight games, he has an eight seventy save percentage. Um, it's not as if they <laughs> would have saved that much more money compared to what Jack Campbell got in Edmonton to what they're paying Ilya Samsonov. Especially, too, it might have saved uh, a certain GM from overpaying someone like David Camp for John Klingberg uh, if you had <laughs> Campbell on the roster instead of Ilya Samsonov. So um, I think Jack Campbell was a good goalie at a time. Honestly, very Freddie Anderson-esque, especially with that one playoff performance where, with, again, the freaking monstrous performance where they lose in seven games. It's like, that sounds very Freddie Anderson-esque in terms of, hey, we have good goaltending in the playoffs, and it doesn't matter anyway. Um, which, I mean, you could say that for Edmonton at times, too. Um, although, whether or not they choose to play the superior goaltender in the playoffs, hmm, because they didn't last year. But <sighs> Toronto, Edmonton. I thought they played Skinner. They did. That's the point. Who was superior over him? Campbell, Campbell. last year? Yeah. Was he? Yeah. Yeah, the uh, save percentages in the playoffs are just the outright stats. And again, save percentages and everything. You could talk about, of course, goals saved above expected, so on and so forth. Uh, but just at a basic level, last season in the playoffs, Jack Campbell played four games, had a 1.02 goals against average, and a 961 save percentage. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, now I remember that. Stuart Skinner, 12 games, 368 goals against average, and an 883 save percentage. Yeah, I remember that. Um, you know, quite a few, I believe. Campbell, I think, God, how many starts? Because that's obviously another factor is how many starts did Campbell have? I only think he had like one because he kept coming in relief and absolutely being a boss. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see the official playoff numbers. Uh, he, st <laughs> he started zero games. Oh, my God. All four relief appearances where he stopped 49 of 51 shots. In those four appearances combined. Does he have and a win in those four games? One win. Yeah, so. No credited losses either to show you that, you know. Uh, you know, hey, I, I also root for a team that didn't start the superior goalie uh, when they should have with Jeremy Swayman sitting on the bench while Lena Salmark was hobbled and doing his best while injured to try and make things happen. Yeah. So I can relate, Oilers fans. I'm going to say. It's fine. I'm going to say. Canada broke Jack Campbell. Canadian teams broke Jack Campbell. Yeah. It's another one in the long Multiple line. times he proved himself the very, very, very capable and good uh, goaltender for both the regular season and the playoffs. And uh, both of those teams have incredibly awful defenses. And he's still like there. Here, here's the thing about that. There's only so long a goaltender can continue to bail you out again and again and again and again and again. Why do you think the Leafs have gone through so many goaltenders? They're gonna they're gonna do the same thing to Wall. He's yeah. already starting to show signs of being broken down. Um, like okay, if you could just go back to Freddie Anderson, terrific, really good, and then all of a sudden, you know, gets broken. All right, let's move on to the next one. I don't even know who the next one was. Was that Campbell? And then they, well, they break Campbell. Get Sam Soto. Looks good at first. All right. Eventually he's broken. Now he's completely broken. But you got Wall coming up. Sparks. Sparks also gave you guys some good games. And uh, mm. then you Sparks guys got. Sparks played through a concussion. Um, yeah. Exactly. What the fuck? Yeah. How do you let the that list, happen? The list of Leafs goaltenders over the last like 10 years or so is nuts. Do you want to? Do you want to play a game of name that leaf goaltender? Because I could probably name no. like a few of them. I just want to play a game of look how many goaltenders they've ruined and are completely not thankful for when they're doing good. 
and then they run them out of town. So it's either they run them out of town or, or, you know, their stats, you know, begin to completely slip and, and fall apart. So if we go back 10 years ago or so goalies that suited up for the Leafs in 2013, whether at the beginning or end of the season, Ben Scrivens. Oh my God. I miss that man. Who, of course, coincidentally also went to Edmonton. <laughs> um, <laughs> the transatlantic pipeline strikes again. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, by the way, Jesus for Ben Scrivens, because there was like that really famous game where he stood on his head. There were a couple of years in Toronto and then splitting time with Los Angeles where he was doing really well, um, yeah. whether by save percentage, goal saved above expected. 2014-15 in Edmonton, 57 appearances, an 890 save percentage, and a goal saved above expected of negative 38.4. That's impressive. That is impressively bad. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Skrvesna, let's go. Shush. That's tremendous. Um, UC Renas oh, as well Rinas, for the Leafs. Yeah. Um, yeah, he didn't, uh, he didn't stick around too much longer. Um, shout out Jonas and Roth. They didn't play a single game for the Leafs, but it was on roster for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Drew McIntyre, Reimer, Bernier. Actually, and Roth did play a couple of games. Wow. Um, Never mind. And Reimer is maybe the worst one who got, who played his ass off for a team and got completely scapegoated. Hmm. But Reimer fucking, and no. Bernier both. Yeah. Now that I think about yeah. it, because Jonathan Bernier um, with the Leaves had a career 915 save percentage. Reimer had a 914. Like, that was honestly solid goaltending from the two of them. It's just they were surrounded by not much, to put Mid. it nice. And I think, personally, the defense on the Leaves has, last year was probably the best it had been in a long, long time. Especially when they rounded things up near the end of the near the end of the trade deadline when they grabbed Luke Shen back in there. They had a mm. bunch of depth, but then they were playing the wrong guys at the wrong time. Like, yeah. <sighs> I miss Sandine. Other other goalies, because this is fun. Calvin Pickard. Oh, my God. Also a, <laughs> also a Edmonton Oiler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Current yeah. backup in Edmonton right now, Calvin Pickard. Oh, it's so great. Oh man, um, Curtis McElhaney. Oh man, Garrett greatest Smith. backup, greatest backup in the world. Curtis McElhaney, Casimir Kaskiswo, Dave Riddick, Freddie Anderson, Peter Mrazek, Michael Hutchinson, Jack Campbell, Matt Murray, Eric Shalgren, Ed Mrazek, Chet Alexander, Joe Wall, and Ilya Samsonov. Whatever all of those Shalgren. goalies in the last Shalgren. Chalgren didn't resign. He wanted to be a backup over in New Jersey. And now he's in the A and he is a merchant with the Utica Comets. He, I was there for his first game against the Marlies and like at first, like, yeah. hey, welcome back. You never because you knew you always give the goalie who played for the former team the first game against the former team. And he was not good. He was not good. I like I like Chalgren, but he was not good that game. Hopefully he finds his game. He was again. That's another case of like he played. He played really good and he got hyped up. It was, it was a repeat of Sparks. I think he just. I think it was holy crap. Mrazik's down. Everyone's hurt. Who's this guy from the A coming up? Because I was at his debut, his NHL debut game when he came in relief after Mrazik got hurt, and I was like, holy shit, they're actually going to put talking, him in. Yeah. yeah, you were talking about him a lot there for a while. Yeah, he he played good. He looked good in this flash. But then after that, like Hole started showing his game. He, I don't think he was NHL ready. I think he needed another year. Crazy. Why'd they rush him? Mm. I wonder why. So Peter really quick, can't stay healthy. That's why. I was intrigued. The Leafs have played 21 goalies in the last 10 years. The Sharks have had 37 goalies in their entire history. That is uh, in pretty a pretty impressive amount of instability across the board, and then not even counting a team like the Bruins, um, who in that time have had, I think, 
12 four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve goalies. Yeah. <laughs> the last 10 years, the Leafs have had 21. Uh, people talk Instagram. about people talk about uh Philadelphia Flyers now they run through goalies. But I think Toronto is worse. Generally yeah, speaking. Philly plays a pretty good defensive system historically. Yeah. And by and large, but Toronto plays a really, really bad defensive system. So they get a goalie on a hot streak, they use them up, and then bye. Because like you yeah. can't play like that forever. That's how it is in the big city. Hey, I'm going to make you a star. And then you get thrown to the curb. Ah, I'm going to make you a star, kid. Yeah, hey, at some gonna... point, it's not every single goalie's fault. That's all I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out there. No, all like, the time. It's the goalie. You can wreck. You can have, like, confidence. The mental game is a huge, huge part of hockey. So, like... I'm going to go out on a limb and say the guys, when they play in those sort of Canadian mar- markets with absolutely atrocious defensive schemes and atrocious defensive players who then get lit up, they they, they get hated on by literally everyone, uh, fans and media, and then they get shipped out. And in this case, Campbell, you know, gets a pretty decently sized contract. Um More years than I'd give him, but I don't mind the price tag because he was coming off of, you know, some pretty – okay stats like Mm -hmm. and again maybe doesn't succeed immediately but he's again in a canadian market he gets absolutely torn apart and i would argue edmonton uh, possibly even worse defensively than toronto i don't know it's very close but uh definitely less deep which is also close but it is less deep I will yeah, say it's one just, thing. It's yeah. just shit situations uh, for for Campbell, but yeah, I'm just gonna you know look at Freddie Anderson. He's done pretty decently in Carolina on average. Hmm. Yeah, just, Carolina has three goalies that they can use at all times. It's him, Ranta, and Kachetkov, hmm. uh, or Kachetkov. It's weird because they don't have a again. Carolina doesn't have an A system, so I don't even know what they're doing right now for their goalies. Like, where do you send Kachetkov? Alone. You love yeah, <laughs> that's that's true. Um, one more thing too. Again, I keep talking about um, Michael Hutchinson because it's a clear situation of like it's literally Toronto markets. Like Sin said, he I don't know what it was, but whenever he played, the team always was like the f- dysfunctional. But the second he left, he got picked up off waivers by I think it was Colorado. He played that one playoff game, had a goddamn shutout. So it's not as if the guy can't play. If you get him in a good system that actually has support for defensive minded players like Colorado had, you can you can do well. It's almost as if if you put a guy like a goaltender with people who you can communicate with and actually, you know, have a team that follows a system and understands how to play fucking defense, you can have a successful goalie. No. Wow. wow. <laughs> Shocker. What well, we've talked about kind of two of the more eh situations right now. I mean, not uh, God. Toronto's still fine. They're doing fine. They're not doing amazing, but they're fine. Um, Obviously, Edmonton is what it is. I want to talk about a good Canadian team. The best Canadian team, in fact, the best team tied as the best team in the Western Conference right now. The Vancouver Canucks who we kind of mentioned on a show earlier. Oh, yeah, they're they're doing all right. They're doing good. Um, they're doing better than that. And I think we need to get kind of give them that proper spotlight and proper shine. And they're being led right now by Quinn Hughes, who is now just the... Uh, here's the list of defensemen. The stat's pretty nuts. Every defenseman in NHL history with 26 or more points through 16 games to start the year. Al McInnes, Bobby Orr twice, Quinn Hughes. That's it. <laughs> that is it. He even beat out McCarr, dude. The exa- well, the, exactly. That is the type of stat that you normally hear where it's like, that's a Kale McCarr-ass stat. And it's Quinn Hughes this time out. Um, he is tied for the league lead in scoring, Quinn Hughes is, with his teammates, Elias Pettersson and JT Miller, which is, yeah, I, I thought he was the worst player in the world. What happened, Canucks fans? <laughs> All of a sudden, it's just, yeah, JT Miller, let's fucking go. Um, what's crazy about this is you look 
up and down this depth chart. Um, Cap Friendly right now has this roster listed as top line. Brock Besser, 21 points. JT Miller, 26 points. And Phil DeGiuseppe. What? Phil DeGiuseppe is listed as their top left wing right now on Cap Friendly. I mean, that's the duo system, man. You get two really good players together and throw out a four checker. It's not a bad strategy. It's not. Yeah, I mean, both those uh, Miller and Besser both have at least 21 points. De Giuseppe has seven. But just get out there, be the rover, put in the work, get the puck to the Yeah, that must be a new kind of thing because he was not on that line when they played the Sharks and made mincemeat out of him. Hmm. Uh, Mikheyev, Pedersen, Beauvillier as the second line in which Pedersen has 26 points. Mikheyev and Beauvillier have 15 combined. Must have a pretty good power play. That's an interesting one. And then you get into the bottom six, which have some points, but nothing crazy. Dakota Joshua, Teddy Bluger, Connor Garland only has five points in 16 games, making almost five million on the third line. You can look up and down this lineup and see certain shortcomings, but their key players, Miller, Pedersen, Besser, Hughes, Philip Ronick. 17 points in 16 games, one goal on the season, which was scored last night, by the way, and set the record. Granted, they haven't been tracking the stat for long with the new edge technology and stuff like that. But Philip Ronick's 107.9 mile per hour one timer is now the hardest shot on record over the past two, three seasons. Um, what about the shooting competition? Was that no, I'm pretty sure didn't Chara do like 109 at the yeah. hardest shot? Yeah, so that's that's obviously a weird one because you've had uh, the KHL has done some weird stuff where they've been like, actually, we had a person shoot at 130 miles per hour and stuff like that. Yeah, there's Martin Russians. Firk in the AHL. Who, oh my God, Firk. Yeah, the, the Firk mom. Yeah, as it's known. Um, th- there's a lot of kind of contested aspects to the whole hardest shot deal, but in game, this is the hardest shot registered again. They've been tracking, I think since 2021. So pretty impressive. Um, we don't know how hard of a shot prime Chara Weber McKinnis, uh, may have put on net, um, in game essentially, but obviously it's nice now to kind of have that proper technology. Chronic is their dad now officially though. Yes, yes. Philip Ronick, <laughs> better than Al McInnes. You heard it here first. Um, the big thing for the Canucks, their goaltending, man. Their goaltending is the been damn good. Thatcher Demko with a 932 save percentage in 11 appearances. Casey DeSmith behind him on a 916. And again, DeSmith was acquired just before the start of the season from Montreal in exchange for Tanner Pearson and Vancouver's third round pick in 2025. So that is looking like it was a pretty solid trade to say the least. And it's one of those situations for the Canucks where I think you could see this sustain itself. I think some people will be rightfully cautious in regards to believing in the Canucks. And I think a lot of Canucks fans would be on that bandwagon as well, because heading into the season, if you were to have told people, oh yeah, Vancouver, Uh, They are going to be, like I said, right now in points percentage, um, they are, because in terms of outright points, they are technically second, but outright points doesn't mean too much at this stage because of differences in games played. Um, You know, Seattle's played 17 games. Chicago's played 13. It can be a pretty big swing. Um, Like I said, they are tied right now for third in points percentage, only behind the Bruins and the Rangers. And they are tied... With Vegas, both teams, an identical 12-3-1 record. I don't think anybody would have seen that. The Canucks, by the way, the best goal differential in the league, plus 34. Second highest is Vegas at plus 23. Um, Uh, Someone won at home, too. They've been great. Yeah, it's unfair, though, because they they, they they got to play the Sharks. (laughs) Fair. And honestly... I had seen that as a topic of conversation. Um, Last night, they played the New York Islanders. Bo Horvat's return 
Which, by the way, people were booing Bo Horvat. The fuck That's the so with weird, you? dude. Like, that was bizarre because he was nothing but good to them. He didn't leave on bad terms. They they traded him. There was the one quote right towards the end that soured a lot of people on him, which... um. <laughs> Is is an interesting one. Like I can understand oh, that he wanted it, I to guess. play in the playoffs or something. Yeah. So the quote was, uh, after making his debut at UBS Arena for the Islanders, uh, Horvat was asked about the about the excitement in the building and support from the home crowd. "Quote: It's been unbelievable. It's a lot better than Vancouver. I can tell you that for free." Here's the thing: What Canucks fan was like, no. We're great, and our home atmosphere is great, and we're all having a good time. Yeah. Who his the name, fuck was saying that last season? His name is AJ Duelist, and he's a fan of yours. <laughs> God. You're only, you're o- only, only Canucks fans are allowed to talk shit about the Canucks. Mm. If you if you talk shit or say their production is unsustainable, they're fucking coming at you in droves. Yeah. Rip Dom's Twitter every time. <laughs> but goddamn, that's funny. Oh god. I just think people shouldn't have been rude to Bo Horvat. I don't I don't think it was necessary. No, he was a, he seemed like a good dude, man. He was an all-star yeah. for him. He was their captain, man. Fucking all-star. But when you're captain after he leaves, man. Mm. I could never. <laughs> the Canucks schedule coming up, by the way. Calgary. Seattle. Lol. San Jose. Fuck. Easy Street. Oh my God. No, sorry, son. <laughs> Colorado to end the month. Or actually, not to end the month. Excuse me. Um, Seattle again. San Jose again. Anaheim. Vegas. On paper, you look at Colorado and Vegas as like the, okay, well, we might not be favorites in this one, but every other game, they're favorites to win those. Uh huh. And then even in December, Calgary, uh, they host New Jersey, Minnesota, Carolina, Tampa. Like, it gets more difficult in December, but man, could they rack up some goddamn points throughout the rest of this month and really put themselves in a spot where, like, 500 play, you know, 500 record level play could be enough to see them through um, just, you know, based off of the hot start. So it would be a good season. For Canucks fans. Could be. Enjoy it. Take your victory lap in November. Um, it's a risky move, though. We'll say that. It's a risky one. Wanted to mention. God damn. We can't escape Canada. We can't. Um, <laughs> Endo, you're a big fan of weird Quebecois things. Yes. Um, Would you like to elaborate the weird uh, Quebec thing that happened in the past few days? Ah, oh, yes. Acadia. Now, to learn your Canadian French history, Acadia is what now is Quebec, and a little bit less of it now because, you know, they separated and became Upper Canada and Lower Canada, which combined to become Canada. Uh, but in more recent news, the NHL has announced that they're going to be playing a preseason game in the Vidéotron Center, or the Centre Vidéotron, um, next year with the Boston Bruins against the LA Kings. So this to me makes a little bit of sense. Um I Boston guess the connection with, Yeah. Um I guess the uh the connection here is, you know, Patrice Bergeron, you know, Quebecois legend, um who no longer plays with the team but is associated with the Boston Bruins is going to be I guess at the event or whatever probably. Um but for Boston to play the LA Kings, who reportedly were given $7 million to the organization to play this game over the Montreal Canadiens, who were going to do this for free. To me, it sounds like the Quebecois government or whoever is you know, doing this is making it an attempt to 
actually see how dedicated Quebecois fans are to get a possible team over there. Because if you can sell out a game with two teams with loose to no affiliation with Quebec whatsoever, except for, you know, Patrice Bergeron and other Quebecois players who play for Boston, and not that many have played for uh, LA. Wait, Pierre-Luc Dubois. Pierre-Luc Dubois. Yeah. So I guess that's a connection there as well for LA. But if you can sell out an arena, which the Videotron Center is a NHL capable arena with seating and everything and the size, if you can sell that out with no Habs affiliation or no direct like Quebecois team being there, I think that opens up a lot more eyes for investors uh, in the NHL to say, hey, maybe that Quebec, that Quebec City thing uh, may be a good idea after all. So if this thing doesn't sell out like immediately when tickets go on sale, I think the the odds of them getting a chance to get a team over there like go from like maybe to like absolutely not. This is this is the prove it moment. You know, you give players prove it contracts. This is the prove it moment for Quebec for Quebec. You have to show out or you shut up. This stadium was built pretty much for the express purpose of getting an NHL franchise. Um, literally, so March 1st, 2011, Quebecor, uh, which is a uh, Canadian telecommunications company, uh, entered into an agreement to acquire management rights to the new arena, a deal expected between 33 and $63 million up front, and then, you know, three to five million in annual rent. But the value of the deal will increase if an NHL franchise moves into the arena with Quebec War actively backing an expansion franchise for QC. This arena was built for the sole purpose of we need to attract an NHL team and get a team back in Quebec. This stadium opened in September of 2015, and it still hasn't happened. Which... Admittedly, I do feel bad. Um, you know, it's an NHL-sized arena housing the Quebec ramparts of the QMJHL. And the Quebec P- uh, minor, minor peewee hockey tournament. They also play on the Videotron Center, which is absolutely hilarious because that barn gets full for like 10 to 12-year-olds, which is fucking hilarious in retrospect. There have been 10 to 12-year-olds who have played a bigger audience than some people will play in their lives, which is crazy. The stat being it's the 19th largest indoor arena in North America and the third largest that doesn't host an NHL team (laughs) is kind of crazy to me. Um, I I was intrigued too at what the biggest were. Um, The Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse in Cleveland um, home of the Cavaliers, which, which is where the Cleveland Monsters of the AHL happen to play. Um, and I think the other one is uh, the Moda Center, where the Portland Trailblazers happen to play. So, hey, maybe things will happen. Maybe they will. Possibly. Potentially. Um, aside from that, I think just viewer questions. There was conversation about the Global Series, which, of course, you had the uh, first game take place in Sweden this afternoon with Detroit and Ottawa. Timmy Stutzel scoring a great goal. But essentially, there's um, speculation out there that the Sens could play in another Global Series game in the next few years in Germany. Instead, with the new building being under construction, the NHL would love to get Stutzel a dry sidle or at cider there, which, yeah, makes sense. Market your stars. Imagine. Yeah. Um, but we did have a question. In honor of the international series that's happening this weekend, what country would you like to see the NHL go to for a few games? And I think that's kind of where you get you get to thinking at this stage. Like, okay, you know, you think about Germany and marketing to those players. What other countries would be good to market to? For um, the meme, Brazil. Because every every time you see a, a music artist, everything be like, Come to Brazil! Come Brazil, just go to Brazil. You know, go to a place that has a really, really good roller hockey team or environment. I know Mexico has one. They have a pretty good roller team, a really good roller experience. 
Um, I think Brazil also has it too, because that's somewhere you could grow the game as well. Hell, they should. Oh man, this would be huge. So a couple years ago, the someone from Canada went over to Kenya and formed the Kenyan Ice Hockey Federation. Mm-hmm. And Kenya has an actual ho- hockey team and hockey rink. Um, I think one of my buddies who plays on my hockey team, Ishtar, um, he goes there a lot and like does training with them and provides gear and does stuff to help grow the arena and everything, which is pretty sweet. I think that would be a great place to go. That would be absolutely incredible for the NHL to go there and do something there, even if it, if it even if it is to donate more gear, or more equipment, facilities, updates, stuff like that. That would be pretty cool. Go to somewhere completely off the map in terms of hockey stuff like Kenya. I don't disagree. Yeah. I was looking at nations that have active players. First and foremost, shout out to Latvia. We need to see Zemgis Gergensen's uh, <laughs> the entire country voted to get into the All-Star game. What was it, like 10 years ago? Um, I need to see Zemgis Gergensen's in front of his home crowd. Um could also go with the Blue Jackets. They have like Elvis Merzlikens there. There's uh, Teddy Bluger as well as an option. Um, France. I don't know if Alex Tessier and pierre Edouard Belmar are enough to market to the French audience, but that could be fun. Um, you have Marco Rossi as the lone Austrian in the NHL right now. Uh, Belarus. Eh. Uh, the Netherlands. Daniel Sprong. He's got a game in Rotterdam. Uh, Slovenia. With Anze Kopitar, Norway Slovenia with Slovenia number one. <laughs> Denmark. This, pod- <laughs> this podcast was once number one in Slovenia. I think Pete Blackburn probably overtook us. That yeah. Podcast, that podcast is skyrocketing. We love Dude, Pete. that's amazing um, content. God, so there, there's a lot of different places. Or you could just go with the joke answer and just be like, fucking. Italy. Wasn't there an NHL or there was at least a hockey game at the Roman Coliseum? Was there not? I'm I think you're thinking sure. of NHL hits. <laughs> no, so this actually happened. Um, oh. Let's How? see. It's like not cold enough. Over um, the weekend, Pool Arena, 2,000 plus year old. Ro- okay, so Roman Amphitheater was transformed into an outdoor hockey venue for a Croatian league game with over yeah, 7,000 people in attendance. That is sick. If you look at this, I have the CBS Sports article up. I'll put in the. <laughs> Got here. That is awesome. Yeah, so literally, it, not the Roman Coliseum itself, but a Roman Coliseum <laughs> did house an outdoor game um, again for the Croatian League, which is honestly, yeah, I'll, I'll put it up here on the video portion. That, that would have been cool as hell. That was it been in cool Croatia, though, in. or was it in Italy? It was in Croatia. Like I yeah, said, I was it was say, a Italy, uh, a, yeah. a coliseum of Roman descent, not the Roman Coliseum. <laughs> yeah, I was like, there's no, there's like zero possible way you could ever make ice there. Hey, they're gonna have an outdoor game, and haven't they had outdoor games? They had a fucking outdoor game in the fucking parking lot of Caesar's Palace in Las yep. Vegas in the nineties. Yeah, and the ice would not stay frozen. It was bad. What do you know? Yeah, I mean, I think the you know, the cooling technology from back then isn't the same as we have right now. They could probably do it a little bit better. Um, but, you know, they had that outdoor game in like L.A. that one time and Dodger Stadium. I think it was it was the Kings versus the Sharks. Yeah. Yeah. So Dodger it can Stadium? be done. Hmm? Did you say Dodger Stadium for the Kings versus the Sharks? Yeah, I think so. No, it was in the Bay Area. I remember because I was there. Um, yeah, I mean, assuming that you'd live there, you probably know better. Fake news. You were never Fake there. News. It was Levi's st- Stadium. Jeans. Home with the jeans. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, um, anyway, um, I would want the NHL to go to Japan. Ooh. Ooh. You have uh, Aito Iguchi make a showcase in the middle of the halftime show, kind of like Pavel Barber does. That'd be pretty sick. Yeah. Funny I think we need more. Yeah, that's Asia is definitely a territory that needs more uh, love from the NHL. There's a yeah. little bit in China. I think they just went to China recently, if I'm not mistaken, or me. A couple weird. years ago, they had the the China yeah. games. Yeah, I think Japan would be another really good one. Like, get the game to grow, make it global. 
And those are two places that is, if Japan likes something, they're going to get fucking hyped about it, man. Like, mm. and they're going to embrace it. They like, man, in the early days of snowboarding, especially when they would do like exhibitions and events there, dude, the Japanese were like, Oh yeah, fuck yeah. And they embraced snowboarding. They embraced the snowboarders more than anyone else too. And mm. yeah. Um, I think I think you have, you know that's that's a really really good spot to help grow the game. And again, we're not going to see these returns like necessarily within the next ten years, but you're thinking decades later, where you know yep. it becomes integrated and becomes more a bigger part of of the culture of that sport. And then hockey is better for it. More players, more talent, more more competition. Fun fact: That's already starting in China. So there's a goaltending uh, coach who works with a lot of. NHL current players and prospects and all that stuff. Um, I think it's called uh, the goalie crease. Um, he actually does a bunch of training in China for a bunch of Chinese players, like young players, like 10, 12, trying to develop them and become better players. They look fucking good. I don't know what it is. Like they're like 10 to 12 or like younger than that. They look pretty good for guys like just trying to learn the sport and everything. Like you would assume maybe 10 years ago, like they'd be like, oh, whatever. It's just like they're not just trying to learn everything. But like their their approach to teaching them is very systematic. I, I would say it's more organized than it is over here because, you know, over there, it's 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 a different way of life and ecosystem and structure over there than it is over here. And it's insane with like how they're training them and everything. Like I was taking that back. And then you also have, you know, the national team program with notable Chinese alumni like Jeremy Smith and Chris Chelios' son, Jake Chelios. John Scott. John John Scott. I will never get over their national team playing national born players for less than 10 minutes of combined ice time during the Olympics. That is funny to me. Do what you got to do to win it. Oh, yeah. Just. Game the yeah. system it didn't work. <laughs> <but> try, <laughs> man. The wa- try. I was in the Wong Dong Tigers, the Kunlun Red Star, or the are the you know the Chinese team of KHL. They don't even play in Kunlun; they play in Moscow. Fun fact: they don't have an arena anymore. Sad fact. Yeah. <laughs> With that, everybody. Somehow, some way, we managed to uh, talk about everything yet nothing for an hour, and we appreciate you for hanging. In there. Oh shoot! We made want- it, gentlemen. We made it. We did it. We yeah. got through another one. We did it. I was gonna say something about women's hockey because there's an update. Yeah. Um, y- I want to have a fun fact because uh, I was talking to uh, the Hockey News' Ian Kennedy, who gets a lot of flack for talking about women's hockey. I don't feel... I mean, I feel bad for him sometimes. And turns out that since this weekend, there has yet to still be a single press release from the PWHL in terms of finding the information. If you wanted to find out where teams are playing, you'd have to talk to the faculty yourself. It's, it's insane. So, another update. The... Toronto-based team, the PWHL Toronto team, has not officially said they're playing out of Madame Athletic Center. But the TMU Bold, their newsletter for the school and everything, were able to contact the faculty and confirm that information. It is insane that a, a, a news publication like the THN or anybody else doesn't have any information about what's going on with the league, but yet if you just walk into the facility and ask the people who work there, it's like, oh yeah, they're gonna be playing here. Like, here's all the dates and everything. Like, there you go. Like, I don't, I don't understand it. Uh, here's, this... an, here's an, ex- yeah, there's an exact quote here. Uh, you can continue. Um, I'm gonna find it, and I'll let you know when I find it. This is a league that has foregone announcing team names for season one. And is having generic branded jerseys that look like Eshel jerseys that just say the name of where they play on them. It All right, keeps getting so, worse in terms of them trickling out news. Yeah. So another update too is so the way this actually broke down is the PWHPA 
does not own the PHF. The way this is, is that the two companies that finance the PWHPA, the Billy Jean King Enterprises and the Mark Walters Group, they bought the rights and certain assets from the PHF. So basically what it is, is they own both the PWHPA and the PHF, and they made the PWHL, which means that the people who are running the PWHPA are not the same people running the PWHL, which is, that's that's a whole, that's one other thing right there. Found out here um, that there has yet to be a single press release from the PWHL other than, you know, the draft and everything. So yesterday I was talking to Ian Kennedy. Uh, talking about branding and everything. And someone was, had a complaint, like, you know, putting up screenshots of tweets and presenting it as an article is doing less than the bare minimum. I'm like, sure, that's fair. I respond. Hard to put stuff out when the league doesn't provide press releases and you have to scramble to find information a month and a half away from puck drop on the an inaugural season. Ian Kennedy replies, we've published 33 articles on women's hockey from the Canadian National Championships, NCAA, Deutschland Cup, and every ounce of PWHL news since Saturday. Last month, we put 165 articles on the league and women's hockey, and as stated above, that's without press releases. They are scrambling to make this league work and give it the press that they can. So if this league does not do have a successful inaugural season, that is not on any of the journalists who are covering this league because they want it to work. This is on the league itself. They are fumbling the bag very, very hard, and it is absolutely insane that this is happening the way it is. I cannot believe this. I, I mean, I can really? believe this, but at the same I way, I know it's behind this. Are you fucking kidding me? It it just doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense. You have all the support from the NHL, you have all the support from all this stuff, and it's just. It's crazy how the one league that was working on their own, doing their own thing, had a massive cap increase of like a million dollars, was doing perfectly fine, had people had people making up to 100K salaries confirmed for, for two seasons after contracts, all that, get bought out, everything's all null and void, now everyone's making between 30 to 80K. You have notable players like Sayora Tinker who were signed on to make a bunch of decent money who are like now retiring at 25 and basically saying that, you know what? I had my fun with the, with the sport and everything. I have assuming a lot of people who are going to get a lot of money that they think that they were deserved to make are retiring because they realize why am I going to work and play hockey for 30 K for 30 K over like a span of like two months or three months or however long, however long the league is when I can go work a job and become a coach somewhere else and make that money, if not even more. Hmm. You got to figure too, most of them, I mean, the primary way to make it work in terms of women's hockey is to go the NCAA route. So pretty much everyone has a college degree that they can, yeah, like you said, try to just be like, all right, I can go make actual money and live instead of, you know, starving artist, basically. Yeah. If they were like, I I want to say like they were younger, you know, like play hockey for a bit, get paid for it. That's, that's totally fine. Like that's the dream. But at the some at certain time, you just have to wake up and realize, hey, you know what? This isn't working for me. I, I think it was who was it on the Seattle Kraken who was going to be a goddamn engineer if hockey didn't work out for him when he played in the ECHL. Can't remember exactly who it was. I think it was it was Morgan Geeky. I think it was Morgan Geeky who has like an engineering degree and was going to be an engine. Fuck, it was going to be a fucking engineer if hockey didn't work out. Played in the E and then became an NHLer. Can't remember exactly yep. who it is. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure either. That does sound familiar, at least. I'll give you that. I mean, um, he was... Mm, it might not be Morgan Geeky. It might be someone else. I don't think he was NCAA, because he he's from Canada. Again, I don't, I don't know if it was him, but it was someone on the Seattle Crack who had a story of basically going he's all in. in. He's on uh, the Bruins. Okay, then not Geeky. He is now, but he was on Seattle last year. Anyway. Hold on. Let me find this. Guess the point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't I, matter who it was specifically. It's fine. It's okay. Yanni It'll Gord. Be- Yanni Gord. It was Yanni Gord who was going to be an engineer. There we go. Sorry. I get hyper-focused on shit. Also, Quebec Quad too. Yeah. Anything about red mittens? No? Yeah. I got anyway. a red Starbucks cup. Does that, does that count? That counts. That does count. Yeah. Um, 
honestly, like, I'm not trying to rush it and just be like, ah. But talking about the PWHL at this point just depresses me. Yeah. Um, Like, just how badly this looks like it's going to go compared to the optimism that was there earlier this year when it's like, oh, finally, there's an agreement. Like, something's going to happen. It's just been depressing overall. So it is what it is, yeah. I do suppose. Um, with that, I do think we need to wind things down. But thank you, Enda, for bringing it up, because honestly, I meant to. Just because the <laughs> we talked about the names and everything, the, the jersey reveals. It's like when the best thing you can say is like, well, the color scheme's cool. It just keeps bringing down the level, basically. But anyway, with that, we will wind things down for this week. Um, we do thank you for joining us again. There wasn't too much to talk about, but hopefully what we were able to discuss was interesting enough to you. If you made it to this point, clearly it was. Or uh, congratulations on doing the dishes. I don't know why it would have taken you this long, but congratulations. Um, with that, Sin, what do you got going on? Normal stuff. Still got my YouTube stuff going on. Edmonton Oilers series still kicking, still doing via pro. And um, that's it. Follow me on YouTube. Sin FTW Productions. Beautiful. Endo Endurance Mills. What's up? Streaming via pro. I've jumped ahead a couple seasons because the game is just a slog of the way that I'm playing it. Maybe because I'm weird. Uh, figured out that be a pro thing. Turns out AI learning was at six out of six and everything else was at zero. So that's probably the reason why everything was super weird for me. Um, yeah, streaming that relatively soon. Uh, probably Sim probably tomorrow. Right. Yeah, Sim was, Sim was right. Um, Endo lied. Uh, NHL died. Um, yeah. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Endurance M. Uh, donate to the Movember campaign. Do that stuff. Support the people. Appreciate you. All I can imagine is just Sim. <laughs> Like Peter, <laughs> confetti and the dead yeah. clown. <laughs> you guys yeah. have been waiting so yeah. so long for the sin was right banner. <laughs> I need to train you how to use your off ice training, Endo. What are you because, talking uh, about? I did. I've I've maxed out. I've I've maxed out. Would you would you would you train first? Offensive awareness. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm going to teach you how to properly off ice train because, uh, there, yeah, that's you, you don't you don't ever, ever, ever train. Oh, I only I only awareness. I only max out offensive awareness in the off season where you can just like max it out completely. Yeah. What's like your skating? super quick? What's my skating? I don't fucking I think I'm like an 87 like speed and like 85 acceleration. Hmm. I'm yeah. in my third year and because I is why went, you fail. <clears throat> No, yeah, I'm in my third year right now, and why you're because at a 64 overall, I'm also a five foot. I started the first as a five foot five guy, five foot five two ten. Anyway, so we'll talk about why. this off off the pod. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned for the continued adventures of uh, Coach Sin in Be a Pro. <laughs> I, have, I haven't in done the meantime, those science, man. In the meantime, I'm the one person not doing anything Be a Pro related or anything NHL 24 related. But hey, the YouTube stuff, you know how it is. Streaming wise, we're on NHL 16 now, baby. Uh, rebuilding the Maple Leafs, who were the worst team at the time. And uh, it's an interesting game. To say How's Kappa? But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's a great question that yeah. people have to tune in to find out. Uh, with that, we'll be back next week. Thank you all for sticking with us. We'll catch you next time. Goodbye.